And I'm uh, very pleased today to be able to introduce and then follow on in a conversation with um, Assistant Secretary Alan Cohn from the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Alan's uh, uh, relatively new expanded title of responsibilities is for strategy, planning, analysis, and risk. So I'm not sure what's left out of there, but I'm, there are other people at DHS, so presumably um, he's uh, uh, keeping other people employed beyond those areas. In addition to leading the QHSR, both the last one and this one, the first was the last one, um, he's also uh, critically important for what comes after the QHSR, and what, hopefully we'll talk a little bit about that today in terms of linking um, strategy and the department's processes for executing strategy. Uh, Alan and I have known each other quite a long time. We're, we're fellow travelers on quadrennial reviews. Mine are the quadrennial defense reviews of the past. Uh, but also, we've worked together on interagency reform efforts, both here at CSIS and through the Project on National Security Reform. Um, Alan is a member of the Career Executive, Senior um, Executive Service, and he has been since 2007. And of note, he has also served uh, plenty of volunteer time as a first responder. He responded to the 2005 hurricane season, September 11, 2001 attacks and the 1993 World Trade Center attacks. Um, so uh, with that, let me turn the mic over to Alan and let him provide us an overview of the QHSR, and then we'll have some conversation. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you so much, Kath. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you all for coming today. It is a privilege uh, to be here as Kath noted we have worked together on, on many different issues, and it's, it's nice to be here to be able to, to talk uh, to all of you uh, in this environment and in this forum uh, about the review uh, that we released. Um, so what I wanted to do was take the opportunity today to talk uh, to all of you about uh, the review itself, um, some of the findings, and also how it fits into uh, the larger initiative on unity of effort within the Department of Homeland Security that Secretary Johnson uh, initiated soon after he arrived at the department. So uh, for those who don't know what the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review is, it is a mandated review uh, that the department undertakes every four years, um, and it really has two uh, dual purposes. Uh, number one is to make recommendations regarding the strategy uh, and long-term priorities of the nation for homeland security. So looking out nationally uh, across homeland security. Second um, is uh, to articulate guidance on the programs, assets, capabilities, budget, policies, and authorities of the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security as one part of the larger enterprise of federal and state, local, territorial and tribal, uh, private sector, international, uh, partners uh, of all types, as well as individually, individuals, families, and communities that all have a place uh, in keeping uh, the American homeland safe and secure. The first QHSR we delivered uh, to Congress uh, in early 2010. And that QHSR, that first QHSR, really answered the question, what is homeland security? Um, it established a, a series of key concepts, laid out a vision, uh, and a set of goals and objectives for Homeland Security. Some of the key things that were articulated in that first review uh, were that, number one, Homeland Security has a forward-looking vision and mission and responsibility. It is not uh, a question of sitting and waiting uh, for the next bad thing to happen. It is ensuring a safe, secure, and resilient uh, American homeland, and doing that together with partners and stakeholders of all types. Um, Following on that, Homeland Security is, is carried out through an enterprise. Again, the Department of Homeland Security is just one piece of the larger national puzzle, um, looking at responsibilities um, and authorities' competencies uh, and effective actions of a wide variety of organizations and individuals. Third was that Homeland Security is deeply rooted in American history. We think about Homeland Security, we think about the attacks of September 11th, uh, but the concept of Homeland Security is really about the intersection of traditional governmental and civic responsibilities with new and emerging threats and challenges. And so we think about things like civil defense, 
customs, uh, border uh, responsibilities, law enforcement. Um, these are things that go back uh, in many uh, instances, uh, decades, if not all the way back to the founding of our republic. Uh, and they are foundational elements of any nation's ability to keep its population safe and secure and resilient. Um, we articulated in the first review, and I want to talk a little bit more about how we uh, furthered this in the second review, that homeland security is essentially about managing risks to the nation. Um, that, uh, and every secretary uh, from Secretary Ridge, Secretary Chertoff, Secretary Napolitano, uh, and now Secretary Johnson have highlighted um, that we face a range of threats and hazards, um, that they pose different degrees of risk, um, and that we need to look at uh, managing that risk to a level that is acceptable uh, to the nation. Uh, that is our charge as, as Homeland Security. Fifth, that domestic security is part of the overall national security establishment. This was something that President Obama articulated in, the, in his first national security strategy, uh, and it's been a theme ever since, um, and that you see echoed in both uh, quadrennial reviews. And then the last thing that, uh, of note, to note from the first review uh, was the articulation of both cybersecurity and national resilience, including all hazards emergency management, as core homeland security missions. All of these foundational elements, all of these key concepts carry over uh, to the second review and carry over uh, to today's conception of homeland security. The purpose of the second quadrennial review, therefore, is different. It's not to repeat this exercise, but to build upon these key concepts, these key principles, uh, and look deeper and more extensively uh, at, the ch at challenges. So we did three things in this review. First, um, we describe changes in the overall security environment that have occurred since the last review. Um, and that's looking extensively at the strategic environment, looking at, at trends, uh, future uncertainties, and in particular looking at it through the lens of risk, strategic national level homeland security risk. Second is to update uh, the goals and objectives that sit underneath the five homeland security missions. Those five homeland security missions endure, but of course changes over the last four years, as well as changes that we can anticipate in the future, uh, advise us uh, to, keep, to update and renew that five mission framework. And then third, this review takes the opportunity to articulate a set of strategic shifts necessary in key specific areas uh, to best address the changed security environment. Um, and again, in doing that, uh, the review reflects a more focused, more collaborative departmental strategy planning and analytic effort, uh, and in that way takes an important foundational step for the Secretary's unity of effort uh, initiatives. So a moment, uh, just a word on that. Um, Secretary Johnson saw very quickly um, that enhancing departmental unity of effort was, a key, was going to be a key element of the success of our department and therefore needed to be a key element uh, of his time uh, as the leader of the department. In April, uh, Secretary Johnson released a memo internally within the department uh, on strengthening departmental unity of effort, outlining his priorities for how the department will manage itself in a more effective way, how the department will build upon the successes that we've had um, and the capabilities and competencies uh, and unique perspectives and authorities of each of our entities uh, to build an organization that's truly greater than the sum of its parts. And so that unity of effort uh, initiative really takes uh, not only a more disciplined and focused look at the development of policy and strategy, but also creates defined linkages in how we drive strategy and policy into execution, both on the investment side with respect to joint requirements and capabilities, programs and budgets uh, and major investments, but also in operations. How do we plan jointly for operations? How do we conduct our operations uh, individually and jointly? Uh, ultimately, all in the service of effectiveness. It results for the American people. Um, and so the quadrennial review provides some of that strategic guidance and the underpinning analysis, uh, a set of clear risk-informed strategic priorities 
uh, to inform the department's path over the next four years. The process of conducting the quadrennial review will look familiar to anyone who's conducted uh, a large-scale review or if you followed large-scale reviews conducted across uh, the international security space. Um, but it basically had four fa uh, three phases. First was a preparatory phase where we assessed the environment, assessed roles, responsibilities, and authorities, uh, and got guidance from our senior leadership. We then carried out studies through a terms of reference, a set of study groups, uh, and meetings uh, and discussions uh, to evaluate decision analysis and make decisions, uh, and then ultimately resulting in the document um, that hopefully all of you have had a chance uh, uh, to see, uh, to download, uh, to look through, uh, and we have fact sheets uh, on the table uh, as you exit the room that give you summaries of the report itself and some of the key findings. So let's talk for a minute about that examination of the strategic environment, because this is one of the things uh, that was a priority for this second review. How can we best assess the strategic environment from the homeland security perspective and draw conclusions about uh, drivers of change and strategically significant risk? Uh, we did a series of examinations of both current and emerging risk, looking at trends, future uncertainties, systemic relationships, uh, as well as threat, uh, and uh, a current picture of risk. And we synthesize that uh, into a set of uh, risk insights, not just risk insights about today, because of course looking at risk insights today tempts us to think too much about what has already happened and not enough about what may happen going forward. But to synthesize our current understanding of risk with our view of trends and future uncertainties systemic and causal relationships to understand what may the risk picture look like going forward. What might pose the most strategically significant risk going forward? Uh, and this resulted in uh, our examination uh, and our articulation of the Homeland Security strategic environment uh, that you see set forth in the report. There is also an important nesting of the quadrennial review the five Homeland Security missions, um, and the risk priorities in the overall national security priorities and imperatives uh, of the U.S. government. So if you've read any of the national security strategies going back through administrations, you see a repeated emphasis on four enduring national interests, security and resilience of the U.S. homeland, our economic prosperity, uh, the, the living um, and advancement of our values both here and abroad, um, and a strong and secure international order. Each of these interests is reflected in the activities and missions of Homeland Security, and each of the mission responsibilities of Homeland Security ultimately works to advance each of those interests. And that leads to the set of Homeland Security missions, which again were first established in the first quadrennial review and carry over uh, into this review. Preventing terrorism and enhancing security is the cornerstone of Homeland Security. Securing and managing our borders, enforcing and administering our immigration laws, safeguarding and securing cyberspace, and ensuring national preparedness and resilience, uh, as well as maturing and strengthening the broader Homeland Security enterprise. These are enduring missions uh, of Homeland Security. But this review recognizes that uh, there needs to be a deeper look at strategic prioritization within the missions. And we're asked from time to time, well, what is the prioritization of the missions? But again, the missions all serve those national interests. So how do we prioritize our activities um, and, uh, and create priorities within those missions? And again, the statements of every secretary going back uh, to the first Secretary of Homeland Security give us uh, the direction on that we need to look at strategic national level homeland security risk to understand what those, pri those strategic priorities, those priorities over time need to be. What are the threats, the hazards, the challenges uh, that face us as a nation within those mission responsibilities? What are the likelihood and consequences of each of those? Um, and how do the trends and future uncertainties and those systemic or causal relationships impact not only the threats and hazards and challenges themselves, but the likelihood 
and the consequences, what directionality uh, do those trends uh, and future uncertainties and systemic relationships suggest. So this is my favorite slide. Um, what we've tried to do uh, is to distill down the strategic environment into a set of six key drivers and six threats, hazards, and challenges that pose the most strategically significant risk over the next four years. So what are those drivers of change? And much of this won't be a surprise. Um, you can observe many of these things in the strategic environment now, uh, and you know uh, there are emerging issues in each of these areas. First, the terrorist threat is evolving. Uh, we know that the terrorist threat that we faced uh, on 9-11 is not the same terrorist threat that we face today. Uh, the world is changing. Uh, the environment uh, in which those who wish uh, to do the United States and its interests harm are changing. Uh, and so Homeland Security needs to adjust and adapt uh, to those changes. Uh, but there are other drivers of change uh, that are important for consideration in the strategic environment. Information and communications technology. When 9-11 uh, uh, occurred, uh, there were no iPhones, right? There were no iPads. Uh, there were no, uh, the, the interconnectivity and the speed of the, uh, the transfer, uh, transfer of information uh, were nowhere near what they are today. Uh, and the pervasiveness of, inter, of information and communications technology and the way that it interconnects all things in the world uh, had advanced dramatically at the time of the first quadrennial review, and it advanced dramatically again between that review and this. And as we look forward into the environment, uh, we see more uh, the interconnectedness uh, of machine to machine, um, uh, of a broader uh, connectivity uh, uh, and automation. Uh, we see that change will continue to happen in that area in a rapid pace, driving not only threats, hazards, and challenges, but their likelihood, consequences, vulnerabilities. Natural disasters, pandemics, and climate change. Uh, we know that uh, these uh, drivers have great impact uh, on the strategic environment. We can see from events over the last few years the increasing not only severity of natural disasters, but the unpredictability of their consequences. Um, as our world becomes more interconnected, uh, as disasters happen in different and unpredictable ways, uh, and, and as they cause cascading impacts through our communities, uh, through our societies, through our infrastructure. If you look at the Homeland Security strategic risk environment, the risk of pandemic stands out, even among those other risks um, that we see. Um, uh, and we'll talk about that uh, in a moment, uh, but a key driver uh, of concern uh, about threat and challenge and vulnerability in the strategic environment. Interdependent and aging critical infrastructure systems and networks. On, after, when 9-11 occurred, we thought the primary threat to our infrastructure was kinetic, was individuals wishing to do it harm, uh, to bring harm to infrastructure through kinetic means. We now know that infrastructure is just as vulnerable uh, to weather, uh, to cyber, intrusion and to its own age uh, and, uh, and consequent vulnerability. Uh, and so both the interdependence and the age of our systems and networks uh, provide uh, questions and challenges for us going forward. They also provide opportunities as that infrastructure is updated and replaced. It gives us the opportunity uh, to build in more resilience, uh, more security, uh, more forward-looking uh, emphasis uh, on the way that we, uh, that we construct and think about our infrastructure base. The volume of people and goods transiting through uh, our, uh, the flows uh, that come in and out of the United States. Um, if you look uh, at, the, at the speed and the volume of flows coming in lawfully uh, through our ports and our borders, um, that's increased at a dramatic pace and is only going to continue to increase. And so we need to be postured in a way that we can keep up with effectively with that flow of people and goods, which is so critical uh, to our economic well-being. At the same time, increased flow of people and goods on the lawful side 
can also mean increased flow of people and goods on the unlawful side. As transnational criminal organizations and others seek to exploit lawful pathways and to create their own unlawful pathways for the introduction uh, of dangerous or illegal uh, goods and items. And then finally, uh, budget drivers, uh, fiscal environment, uh, the overall national uh, fiscal environment puts pressure on all elements of the homeland security enterprise, not only the federal government, but state government, local governments, territorial and tribal governments, uh, most parts of the private sector, many of our international partners, uh, and most individuals, families, and communities all feel the pressure of the current fiscal environment. Um, and so how do we effectively ensure the security and resilience of our nation uh, in that environment? Uh, so those six key drivers, uh, which we've represented in kind of what we call any city USA, um, and some of the, the key trends and the key statistics that you see on the, on the slide drive us to uh, a set of strategically significant threats, hazards, and challenges. Uh, so what are those? First, the terrorist threat, as we talked about, is evolving and remains significant as attack planning and operations become more decentralized. The United States and its interests, particularly in the transportation sector, remain persistent targets. Second, growing cyber threats are significantly increasing risk to critical infrastructure and to the greater U.S. economy. Third, biological concerns as a whole, including bioterrorism, but pandemics, foreign animal diseases, and other agricultural concerns endure as top homeland security risk because of both potential likelihood and their potential impact. Nuclear terrorism, uh, through the introduction and use of an improvised nuclear device, while unlikely, remains an enduring risk because of its potential consequences. Transnational criminal organizations are increasing in strength and capability, driving risk in counterfeit goods, human trafficking, illicit drugs, and other illegal flows of people and goods. And finally, natural hazards are becoming more costly to address with increasingly variable consequences driven by trends such as climate change and aging infrastructure. So our look at the environment identifies a set of key drivers, and that allows us to, uh, to discern a set of strategically significant risks, over, uh, threats and hazards that pose uh, the most strategically significant risk over the next four years. Some of the guiding principles uh, that we articulate in this second review. First, again, the cornerstone of Homeland Security is preventing terrorism but Homeland Security must be multi-threat and all-hazard. Uh, we talked about in the first review how all-hazards emergency management was a fundamental element of Homeland Security. In this review, we recognize, again, what a reality that everybody who operates in this environment knows is that Homeland Security is multi-threat as well. Second, something equally apparent on its face to everyone who operates in this area, Homeland Security supports economic security uh, through ensuring uh, the safe uh, and efficient movement of people and goods uh, through lawful means across our borders in service of our economic well-being and our health as a nation. Homeland security and economic security are inextricably intertwined. Third, homeland security requires a networked community. In the first review, we talked about the Homeland Security Enterprise. This review recognizes that we must continually strive to network that enterprise together, uh, to share information, to share best practices, to build capacity, um, so that we can all work together towards common ends. Fourth, that Homeland Security relies upon the use of market-driven solutions and innovation. We must recognize uh, the market nature of some of the threats and hazards and challenges that we face and recognize the vast potential of market solutions and partnership across pro public and private sectors in addressing uh, threats, hazards, and challenges. Fifth, um, and though it should need no, uh, no re-emphasis, we do so here. Homeland Security upholds civil rights and civil liberties. Thinking about the national interests that have been articulated in successive national security strategies our homeland security activities serve all of those interests, 
uh, including our values, here and abroad. And sixth, again, homeland security is national risk management. And so this review makes the effort to evaluate the strategic environment, articulate those threats, hazards, and challenges that pose the most strategically significant risk, and articulate strategies, either new or shifts or re-emphasis of things already done to address those most strategically significant threats, hazards, and challenges. With apologies for the eye chart, this is, again, uh, the, the mission framework for Homeland Security. Uh, the five missions that we've discussed and their sub-elements and maturing and strengthening the Homeland Security Enterprise. Again, this review re-emphasizes this mission framework and structure, and updates the goals and objectives underneath to reflect changes over the last four years and changes that we foresee going forward. So what did we look at in this review as a result? Uh, there were five uh, studies linked to findings in the strategic environment uh, and to guidance from leadership. Uh, and then we recount and reemphasize the, the approaches that we are already taking to other pressing challenges, hazards uh, across the Homeland Security environment uh, within this review. Um, so this review talks about how we will secure against the evolving terrorism threat, how we will safeguard and secure cyberspace. It articulates a homeland security strategy for countering biological threats and hazards, building on all of the work that has done, been done before, but recognizing not only the enduring nature of this risk, but the increasing nature of this risk. The review articulates a risk segmentation approach to securing and managing flows of people and goods. What does that mean? It means that the different types of threats and challenges uh, that, come, uh, that face the country through the flow of people and goods are different that just the volume and speed of lawful goods is different than the profit-motivated actions of transnational criminal organizations, is different than the ideologically motivated or naturally occurring challenges that can come through uh, the flows of goods and people entering and exiting our country. And finally, uh, the review uh, examined uh, and articulates a basic way of thinking about uh, executing our missions through public-private partnerships. Again, building on all of the work that's been done, uh, not only over the last four years, uh, but uh, since the inception uh, of the department on public-private partnership in a number of different venues. Based on uh, the strategic environment, our mission responsibilities, the review also uh, discusses and reemphasizes the approaches that we are taking uh, to countering nuclear terrorism using an, an improvised nuclear device, uh, our approaches to managing the challenge and challenges and opportunities of immigration, um, and our approaches to national preparedness uh, and our whole community approach. Okay, so what does the review say about each of these things? With respect to the terrorism threat, uh, again, the nature of the terrorist threat to the United States has changed dramatically since the September 11th, 2001 attacks. Just since 2009 in the publication and the, the conduct of the first quadrennial review, we've seen the rise of Al-Qaeda affiliates, such as Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, which has made repeated efforts to export terrorism to our nation. And that is, that's one challenge, the external challenge coming into our homeland. But we also know that we face the threat of domestic-based lone offenders and those who are inspired by extremist ideologies to radicalize to violence and commit acts of terrorist violence against Americans and the nation. And so this second quadrennial review outlines an approach to focus on countering violent extremism and help to prevent complex mass casualty attacks, building again on the, pre on the strategies and policies articulated uh, by the president uh, and by the department in this area. Um, the approach to counterterrorism and the shifting and evolving uh, approach to preventing terrorist attacks prioritizes identifying, investigating, and interdicting threats as soon as possible, including providing support to international partners to increase their border management, customs integrity, and law enforcement capabilities and capacities, and to use information received in advance uh, to screen dangerous goods and people abroad based on risk 
waiting for rather than waiting for arrival in the United States. These are concepts uh, that have been instantiated in our approach uh, to terrorism over successive administrations. We reemphasize these areas uh, and articulate new uh, and, uh, and evolving ways uh, to use these types of approaches to counter the terrorist threat as we see it today and as we see it evolving in the future. Safeguarding and securing cyberspace. Each and every day, the, the United States faces a myriad of threats in cyberspace. From the, th from the theft of U.S. international property through cyber intrusions to denial of service attacks against public facing websites and attempted intrusions of U.S. critical infrastructure. To address these threats, we've identified four strategic priorities. Strengthen the security and resilience of critical infrastructure by leveraging the work being done pursuant to Executive Order 13636 on improving cybersecurity critical infrastructure and Presidential Policy Directive 21 on critical infrastructure security and resilience, each of which build on uh, previous efforts, U.S. government and national efforts uh, to strengthen, safeguard, and secure cyberspace. Uh, securing the federal civilian government information technology enterprise by helping federal civilian agencies manage cyber networks, advancing law enforcement incident response and reporting capabilities through close coordination with our partners across the law enforcement and incident response uh, and reporting community, and strengthening the broader cyber ecosystem by collaborating with communities domestically and abroad, standardizing information sharing practices, and developing a skilled workforce. With respect to, to biological threats and hazards, as we noted, again, the strategic environment assessment and the assessment of strategically significant risk continues to point us uh, towards biological threats and hazards. Not just bioterrorism, but, um, but emerging infectious disease, again, foreign animal disease, agricultural concerns, as a top risk that we currently face and a risk that's only growing over time. So how can we best build on the work that's been done to date, the lessons that have been learned and implemented from previous events, previous exercises? Uh, our approach is to stop incidents involving priority biological threats and hazards before they escalate to overwhelm state, local, tribal, and territorial partners while ensuring that those partners have the capabilities and capacities necessary to manage and respond to mid-range biological incidents. And so, what is, and so what does that mean? Prevent those biological incidents from occurring where possible, improve risk-informed decision-making, identify biological events early, improve confidence to act, not just within our department, not just within the federal government, but across the whole Homeland Security enterprise. Respond and recover effectively from biological incidents and maintain vital services and functions during and after bi biological incidents. Uh, maintain our ability to continue to function not only as a society, our infrastructure, our critical services, should an event of this type occur. With respect to managing flows of people and goods, Again, the movement of people and goods around the world has expanded dramatically in recent years. As the volume of global trade and travel increases, the potential for illegal transport of people and goods across our borders also increases. The Department of Homeland Security and our partners continue to secure and manage flows of people and goods to ensure economic prosperity and minimize risk. So based on an in-depth look at the flows of people and goods, we see three distinct but interrelated types of flows, each of which requires a different risk-based approach by DHS and our partners. Different but inherently interrelated. First, the legal flows of people and goods. How do we stay ahead of increasing flows, increasing volumes, increasing demands, uh, and not only safeguard but expedite the flow of lawful, uh, the lawful flow of people and goods into and out of the United States? Second market or profit-driven illicit flows of people or goods. Transnational criminal organizations and others engage in wide-scale activities um, uh, to bring uh, illicit goods into the United States and reap profits from those activities, uh, but they do this for profit. Um, and so how can we tailor 
our approaches uh, to, best, uh, to best approach those activities, which are different than lawful challenges and different than ideologically driven challenges. And then third, terrorism and other non-market concerns. Ideologically driven threats and challenges or naturally occurring threats and challenges. How do we ensure that these neither disrupt lawful flows of people or goods nor exploit them uh, for ill purposes? Segmenting flows of people and goods in this way permits a more, more focused strategies and more efficient allocation of resources. Strengthening the execution of our missions through public-private partnerships. Many of you are probably familiar with the National Infrastructure Protection Plan and our overarching uh, framework of cooperation and coordination with our private sector partners through now the 16 critical infrastructure sectors and the network of sector-specific agencies across the federal government and sector coordinating councils made up of our private sector partners across industries. Uh, this is a very strong and important set of public-private partnerships for Homeland Security, but it's not the only set, whether it's the Coast Guard's captain of the port relationships uh, with shippers, state and local law enforcement, uh, our partnerships across uh, the movement of people and goods across the U.S. government with the private sector and with other partners. Uh, there are many examples uh, across uh, Homeland Security and across the U.S. government uh, of governmental relationships and agreements with private sector partners uh, to enhance security and safety uh, and ensure national resilience. E although each of these partnerships emerge from unique circumstances and specific challenges, there are important commonalities, models, lessons learned, and best practices that can be applied to a range of other Homeland Security challenges. And so the QHSR provides a structured way of thinking about partnerships that focuses on a couple of key things. First of all, what is the partner, partnership aimed to do? Second, what are the interests that are at play? What are the public interests? What are the private interests? And how do they align? Where are the shared outcomes? What are we together trying to do? Whether that's on a day-to-day -day basis, whether that's in the event of a contingency or a crisis, or whether that's meant to, uh, to be a relationship that can span through both, uh, that we use on a day-to-day -day basis and then can scale up uh, to work effectively in crisis. Uh, and then finally, so thinking about shared outcomes, aligned interests, what are the models, the archetypes, the ways that we might structure public-private partnerships uh, to do things? Obviously, information sharing sits at the heart of public-private partnership. Um, but there are other models that go beyond uh, information sharing. And in the review uh, and a companion document uh, soon to be released, we talk about uh, the different models and archetypes, the ways of thinking about interests and outcomes and aligning them uh, under common archetypes and models. Uh, and we do this as a tool not only for ourselves, but for the entire enterprise to think about how we can use public-private partnerships most effectively uh, to reach our common ends. Uh, in addition to these areas, uh, we also emphasize, again, uh, our continuing approaches, our renewed emphasis uh, on countering uh, terrorism using an improvised nuclear device, uh, on advancing uh, rational, com uh, common sense, comprehensive immigration reform, uh, and advancing national preparedness and resilience uh, under the mechanisms of the national preparedness system, the Post-Katrina Emergency Management Reform Act, and Presidential Preparedness Directive 8, all of which set up a comprehensive national preparedness system uh, for prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. A key element of the quad this quadrennial review and every quadrennial re review is engagement with stakeholders. In the first review, we engaged with stakeholders through a variety of manners. In this review, we sought to strengthen and deepen the engagement with the Homeland Security community in informing, uh, in informing the studies and the conclusions of the review. To that end, we conducted extensive engagement 
uh, with three sets of key and critical partners. First, we sought to use this exercise as an effort uh, to bring greater unity within the Department of Homeland Security. So reaching across all of our operational components, our offices and our directorates and leveraging subject matter expertise uh, from across the organization. But that's only the starting point. Uh, we looked also across all of our federal partners, uh, speaking with Congress, uh, with entities within the Executive Office of the President, including the National Security Council staff and other uh, essential offices within the Executive Office of the President, and of course, our key and critical partners across the federal interagency, whether that's the Departments of Defense and Justice, State, Health and Human Services, and a wide array of others uh, in discussing uh, and arriving at uh, the conclusions for how we address homeland security threats and challenges. And then beyond that, homeland security communities of interest. Again, we wanted to deepen our engagement with those, those people in the communities of practice, those people on the front lines of conducting homeland security activities day after day uh, to engage uh, and receive their input um, and advice. And we did that um, primarily through two online venues. Um, a platform for submitting ideas uh, called Ideascale, um, and the firstresponder.gov uh, community of practice administered through our Science and Technology Directorate. Uh, and through all of that, uh, not only that enabled us to gain greater input from the broader Homeland Security enterprise, but it allowed us to ask targeted questions, to gain input and provide the opportunity to comment, agree and disagree, add new ideas. Through that engagement, uh, we had over 2,000 unique registrants on the idea scale and community of, pla uh, community of practice sites. We had submitted over 200, nearly 250 new ideas, again, over, over 2,500 comments, and over 11,000 votes uh, on different targeted questions, issues, comments, uh, and other issues raised on the site. And that input and analysis, those questions, ideas, and comments were tracked brought back into our studies uh, and incorporated into the analysis that led to the final decision making. Uh, so where do we go from here? Uh, again, a strategic review is, a, is, a, is an important thing. A strategic review allows an organization and its partners uh, to examine its principles, its missions and its goals, to look at the strategic environment, to engage together uh, in a discussion, sometimes difficult, uh, about priorities, about approaches, uh, and a way to communicate that uh, to the broader community as a whole, in particular to our homeland security communities of interest. But it's only as good as the execution that follows it. Uh, again, Secretary Johnson, through his Unity of Effort initiative, has laid out a number of different ways in which the department will, will be taking steps, and is already taking steps, uh, to improve our ability uh, to a survey the strategic environment, to set policy, to define strategy, um, and then to take policy and strategy and drive it into execution, uh, into the way that we do investment. Again, through the examination of capabilities and requirements, uh, through a close examination of our programs and budgets, uh, and the ways and, and manner in which we invest and make our major investments and also in the ways that we operate, in the ways that we communicate and coordinate with our partners, in the ways that we plan uh, for operations, both individually and together, uh, and the way that we execute our operations. Because ultimately, Homeland Security is an operational activity. It is about the execution of activities to keep our nation safe, secure, and resilient. And so this quadrennial review forms an essential element and an underpinning element uh, of the Secretary's unity of effort uh, activities. So in conclusion, let me just say thank you for the opportunity to walk you through what we've done in this review, uh, to talk to you a bit about the findings uh, that we've reached, uh, and to open to you uh, the opportunity to, for dialogue and discussion. I know that we will have a, a discussion about questions, uh, and then you will hear from an outstanding panel of individuals uh, who have a long history in this area uh, and will have deep insights uh, for you 
uh, on the findings of the review uh, and other thoughts about Homeland Security. Uh, so with that, let me um, conclude my remarks uh, and sit down for questions. Thank you very much, Alan. And as you said, I, I neglected to mention at the beginning that we do have a fantastic panel following. Um, so we'll try to uh, get you out on time. I know you have to leave here um, right around 10. Um, and I know the audience has some questions. I do want to raise a few myself. Um, the first is from your perspective, having done the first QHSR in 2010 and now this one in 2014, what do you think has really changed the most or evolved and matured inside the Department of Homeland Security or, or across the broader Homeland Security sector that really affected the way in which this review was put together or its implications? Well, that's an excellent question. And, and I think that this second review reflects a maturing in a number of ways. Number one, um, that the Homeland Security enterprise as a whole has a greater understanding of itself and of the ch threats and hazards and challenges that it faces. So as we conducted a, a analysis and evaluation of trends, uncertainties, systemic relationships, threat, risk, we were able to draw on not only the subject matter expert, our expertise across our department and across the federal government, but reports and studies data and analysis that's collected across the Homeland Security enterprise. Um, and that, that only strengthened our ability to, to look at ourselves and ask uh, these difficult questions. Second um, is the ability of our department uh, to wrestle with these questions ourselves. Um, I think that this review reflects uh, an enhanced ability uh, of our department, not only our subject matter experts, but our leaders, uh, to really grapple with these issues together. Um, and to look at, at shared and joint approaches. Uh, and I think you see a maturing of the way uh, that, the, that the overall Homeland Security enterprise can grapple with these issues. Obviously, um, as we've talked about, as I talked about with the strategic environment, the environment has changed. The threats and hazards and challenges have evolved. Um, and so we need to be in constant dialogue with each other uh, about not only what is changing, but how we change our approaches uh, with respect to those. Yeah. Um, and I did want to, that gets very directly to the next question, which is about the changes in the threat environment, some of which you, you walked through. Um, one that sort of popped out as we looked at it here at CSIS is the, is the increased emphasis and reframing on the bio threat. So I'm interested on, on how that's evolved in the thinking. If you think the threat has evolved or just the thinking about the threat has evolved. And then more generally, you know, given the rapid evolution of the envi threat environment and the changing nature of how the, the risks lay out, how, how, how challenging do you think that is to have a risk framework tied to an annual budget process but with a rapidly changing environment? That's something the entire national security community is grappling with. And if you have lessons learned from the work that you all have done on risk management, it would be great to hear. Well, I think that, that using a risk lens and conducting na national risk assessment is absolutely essential to thinking about Homeland Security. Again, Homeland Security is an exercise in national risk management. It's an exercise we all engage in, um, and it's a thought process that we all go through. Conducting that strategic national level risk assessment is one element of that, and we're aided uh, in that by lessons learned from some of our international partners who have been conducting these types of assessments and finding very similar uh, results, in particular, um, finding uh, similar things about uh, the risk of pandemic disease uh, and biological challenges. Uh, we're also aided uh, by the growing network uh, and ability of localities and states and regions to conduct threat and hazard identification risk assessment processes on their own uh, with uh, assistance and support um, through, uh, through FEMA. Uh, as part of the Department of Homeland Security. And so communities all over the country, states and regions are conducting their own threat and hazard identification and risk assessment processes that can be married in to that strategic national look at risk. Now, risk isn't the only way uh, that we prioritize our actions, right? It can help us, from a strategic national perspective, identify strategic national risks. But those aren't the only types uh, of priorities we need to grapple with. 
there are shorter and closer in challenges, uh, emergent issues, uh, but, a net, but a risk approach allows us uh, to set strategic priorities and to look to reach them over time. Now, specifically with respect to biological challenges, um, I do think that the challenges posed by, by biological threats and hazards as a whole are things that are known by the community. At different times um, since the inception of the department, we've grappled with uh, challenges posed uh, both uh, by uh, bioterrorism events, um, and particularly the, the malicious use of, of, of anthrax, um, but also with a series of different um, naturally occurring uh, events that had the potential to cause human pandemic, whether it was SARS uh, or different varieties of, uh, of influenza. Um, each of those has illustrated uh, the challenge. We took the opportunity in this review to look both from a risk perspective and a strategy perspective at those challenges as a whole. Uh, because we understand that while the motivations and causes may be different, in many ways, uh, not only the ways that we would detect um, or otherwise know that such an event was occurring, and the steps that we would take to address it as a nation are largely the same. Um, and so the quadrennial review gives us the opportunity uh, to do things, not only to be able to identify such a risk, but to lay out a strategy that we can seek to implement over time as part of a larger set of priorities uh, to address that risk and not have to wait for an event to occur uh, for, us to have to, for us to take action to address the risk. Okay, thank you. In the interest of time, uh, because we are running short, what I'm going to do is uh, have a couple people um, ask questions. We'll collect those for Alan. He can um, answer them. I do ask that you make it a question, because we really are short on time. Um, no statements, please. And give your name and your affiliation. And we'll have we have folks with microphones, so go ahead and raise your hands if you have questions. Let's see, I have one here. We'll keep going after the question. Yeah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm Seguero of International Group. Thank you very much for your presentation. How, looking at the report, how are you working with international public and partnership with the government, private sectors, and the communities? Because when it comes to uh, traveling, transfer people, you know, and uh, goods, terrorism, are maybe from Africa or they change passports, they change uh, names and they change. And to, how do you work with this in, with international communities to make this a uh, priority of homeland security? Okay, great. Protect the country. Other questions? Is there one right here? Thank you. My name is Jeannie Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. In your assessment of the threats, would you tell us uh, which one, how percentage-wise, the uh, state actors and the non-state actors? And also, have you been able to utilize all of our networks, including um, Congress, um, you know, the uh, Department of State, Department of Defense, all that together to share information and to mitigate the threat, to prevent it? Prevention is important. And have you seen the relationship between our foreign policy with fast raising inside the country? Okay. Thank you. And then I have one back here. And then I'll stop, I promise. <laughs> Lloyd Solis, University of Maryland. You made mention of our aging infrastructure. Uh, just in case another huge earthquake would happen, especially in the Pacific side, of the country like California all the way up to Alaska. And because our infrastructure are aging, just how resistant are our infrastructures on that side of the country, just in case a strong magnitude earthquake would happen? Thank you. OK, so the three questions are essentially, how well are you um, partnering internationally to execute the missions at DHS, and presumably also in your outreach for stakeholders on the QHSR? Um, the threats of state versus non-state, the relative threats, and then also how well are you sharing information on mitigating threats across the interagency and then infrastructure? Well, good. No, those are uh, an excellent set of questions. On our international partners, this was something that was recognized early on and that each of our secretaries um, has emphasized together with our other partners across uh, the federal government is that, and at the state and local level as well, engagement with our international partners is critical uh, to addressing these threats and hazards and challenges. Um, and we have a wide range of cooperative relationships 
uh, with counterpart uh, entities across the globe as well as uh, relationships with non-governmental organizations and civic organizations aimed at addressing this wide range uh, of threats and hazards and challenges. So international engagement uh, is extremely important uh, to fulfilling Homeland Security mission responsibilities and reaching the ends uh, that we really wish uh, to reach. In terms of the percentage of, uh, of state actors versus non-state actors uh, in our threats, I think it varies um, across uh, the strategic environment. Um, and whether, and I would add some other categories to that. Um, there may be state actors, there may be non-state actors, transnational criminal organizations, um, organized uh, uh, criminal organizations, individual actors, natural phenomena. It's difficult to per put a percentage on those things. What's most important to recognize is that that threats and hazards and challenges emanate from all of those different sources. Uh, and that can fluctuate over time based on trends and uncertainties uh, and other types of drivers. And so it, it illustrates and highlights the importance of looking across the strategic environment uh, as we think about the range of threats and hazards and challenges. Um, to, go, uh, to build on the question about our international partners and really all of our partners, information sharing underpins uh, almost everything that we do. Um, information sharing enables the vast network of partners uh, within our department, across the federal interagency, uh, within state, local, territorial, and tribal governments, non-governmental organizations, the private sector, to act on their own and in concert with each other uh, and other partners uh, to effectively address challenges. No organization, be it a federal cabinet department, a local police department, a non-governmental organization, a private sector entity can take on these challenges alone. And so we all must work in concert with each other and the sharing of information underpins all of that. Uh, the last point, and I think it's a very good one, and it's one that we, we highlight in, the, in the, re the report on the review itself, is that the aging nature of our infrastructure does cause, a, cause concern, I think, nationally about its resilience. And it is why, uh, when the President issued Presidential Policy Directive 21, um, we evolved our approach, our national approach, to thinking just about critical infrastructure protection, to think about critical infrastructure security and resilience. Um, and not only resilience, uh, against uh, human-caused challenges, uh, but resilience uh, across the range of challenges. You mentioned earthquakes, other types of naturally occurring events, other types of vulnerabilities, um, and the vulnerabilities that come just simply from its age. And to try to drive to think about how do we better design in uh, security and resilience to our infrastructure as one of the key ways uh, that we will achieve uh, the type of risk management that, that we're trying to achieve and achieve our Homeland Security goals. If I can indulge you on one more quick round of questions and then we'll wrap up with Secretary Cohen. Come over here to the, go this side of the room. So start here. As you know, during the Cold War, the public didn't have much of a role in deterrence. But you mentioned before about the looming threats of uh, new kinds of technologies of synthetic biology and individual actors acting alone possibly sometime in the future, deploying and making weapons of mass destruction. Have you looked at how to engage the public? What is the public's roles, plural? And it, it had to be international, because if the US does everything perfect, it's not enough. So that goes back to the international cooperation, but not just nation state, but how do you, Great. what's the public's role? And just remember to give your name and affiliation, oh, please. I'm Jerry Glenn uh, with the Millennium Project. Thank you. John Hurley, I teach at Catholic University. Um, in all of the presentations, I didn't see any indication at all about religion. And certainly extremist, fundamentalist, violent adherents of religion have played a big role in, in this whole problem as it has developed. Does the department have any particular section or focus into this area, whether both domestically and internationally. Okay, and one more right here. Uh, 
I'm Mark Rockwell. I'm with Federal Computer Week. How has the nature of the cyber threat changed since the last uh, QHSR? Good. Let me take those uh, in order. Uh, it's interesting, the, the, the statement in that in the Cold War that the public didn't have much of a role uh, in deterrence. Uh, in a sense, though, uh, the entire civil defense mechanism in which uh, individuals were taught you know, what to do and what to act was both for a, uh, a protective uh, uh, per, from a protective perspective, but also to create something of a deterrent effect. Um, and so there were efforts to engage the public, you know, in civil defense efforts during the Cold War. Uh, you know, today, with the distributed nature of threats and challenges, the pervasiveness of information and communications technology, uh, every person has a role um, and, and, uh, and an opportunity to make decisions uh, about uh, actions that can impact the security and resilience of the United States. Um, and so efforts like the If You See Something, Say Something campaign uh, that originated with the New York City Transit Administration and that has been used um, by the Department of Homeland Security and brought to a number of different uh, partnerships with jurisdictions around the country are important ways that, that we engage the public on specific challenges. But I think the underlying point is the, is the important one is that the public must be engaged in all of these activities. Um, and one of the key ways that we do that um, is to uh, share information, uh, to provide ways of acting, and also to engage in activities like the review. One of the, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we did was not conduct a review in a vacuum that was only for a small set of decision makers, but rather, could we do a review of the strategic environment, of the risk environment, um, of challenges and strategies, and then make that as public as we can, provide that information you know, uh, to people across the nation so that they can understand the challenges that, are, that we face, uh, the opportunities that exist in the strategic environment and the ways for individuals uh, to be involved, whether that's through organized activities, volunteering, um, becoming part of civic organizations, non-governmental organizations, or just in the, in the actions we take each day, either through structured processes, like if you see something, say something, or just individually on their own in their communities. With respect to motivations, you know, there's a wide variety of motivations that, that, that motivate uh, people uh, to engage in, uh, in violent acts. Uh, obviously, ideology is one of those, um, and it's a, it's a focus not just for the department, but for the U.S. government as a whole. One of the things that we do note in the review, though, uh, and it's an important finding and something that, that we want to help, uh, that we want to learn from and that we want to help jurisdictions around the country learn from, um, is that there are certain aspects of this challenge that depend on you know, the ideology or what ideology is motivating violence. But in many ways, the acts, at mass, acts of mass violence present themselves in similar ways. They present similar challenges to communities and to law enforcement and emergency response organizations, um, and they present similar indicators uh, and stressors. And so what can we learn uh, from, uh, from uh, events of mass violence, those that are motivated by particular ideologies and those that are not motivated uh, by ideology, but are motivated by other, uh, uh, by other means or by nothing at all, um, to look for common indicators common intervention points, and common ways that we can prepare to most effectively respond. On the last question in terms of the, the cyber threat landscape, and I would broaden that out to the cyber risk landscape, I, I mean, I think the changes have been dramatic since the last quadrennial review, and they're going to be dramatic between now and the next quadrennial review. Um, the pervasive, again, going back to the pervasiveness of information and communication technology connecting people, um, uh, the nature of that has changed uh, remarkably over the last four years, and the connection uh, of uh, and the and the use of of uh, those technologies uh, to drive the way uh, that we conduct our daily lives, or we conduct business, we operate our infrastructure, uh, has created huge opportunities. Um, but uh, it has led to an increased uh, increased threat as in greater and greater numbers of malicious actors. Uh, seek to exploit uh, that mechanism. It's led to increasing numbers of vulnerabilities. Uh, you can't go a week without opening the paper and, and seeing uh, another 
perhaps previously unknown vulnerability emerge um, that needs to be addressed. Um, and the interconnected nature of our populations and our infrastructure have, have increased consequences, both direct consequences and the potential for cascading consequences. As we begin to move uh, to an industrial internet and to, a, to an internet of, of, of things connected to things, machines connected to machines doing, uh, uh, doing work, that will only increase. Um, va again, vast opportunities, but also increasing vulnerabilities and increasing potential for consequences. Uh, so this is one of the most dynamic areas uh, that, we, that we look at in Homeland Security and will continue to be uh, a top challenge and a, uh, and a source of strategically significant risk going forward. Secretary Cohen, you've been uh, more than generous with your time. I want to thank you for coming out to CSIS this morning, and I want to congratulate you on uh, getting another quadrennial review out. I know the feeling, and uh, as I joked with Alan beforehand, um, often when you finish one of these reviews, people say, what are you going to work on now? And I know very well that all the challenges, the big challenges remain ahead in the execution, and that is a daunting challenge for the Department of Homeland Security. So we appreciate your time, and if we give a round of applause, I'll then introduce uh, Paul Sauer. Excuse the informality, I'm going to introduce our uh, panel moderator uh, from my chair here. Um, uh, we're very fortunate to have former Assistant Secretary Paul Stockton, who is also a senior advisor here at CSIS, um, here to moderate our panel. Uh, Paul was the Assistant Secretary for Homeland Defense and America's Security Affairs in the Department of Defense. Um, he also led, importantly, in September 2013, he was asked by Secretary Hagel to co-chair the uh, independent review of the Washington Navy Yard shootings. Um, he began his career with Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, which is one of my favorite facts about him. Um, and Paul is incredibly accomplished um, in all of his government service, but also currently serves as the managing director of SonCon LLC. And he's going to introduce the panel here today. So please join me in, in welcoming Paul. Thank you, Kath, for that generous introduction and to CSIS for hosting this very important event. Uh, it is true that as Assistant Secretary of Defense, I had the privilege of bringing DOD capabilities to bear in support of the Department of Homeland Security in Superstorm Sandy on the southwest border, many other occasions. I'll be candid with you. In many cases, when we provided support to the Department of Homeland Security, we found that sometimes the left hand did not know what the right hand was doing. One component of the Department of Homeland Security was not well integrated with another. It made not only support to the department more difficult, but it reflected a broader lack of cohesion across an absolutely vital part of the federal uh, government. That's why Secretary Johnson's Unity of Effort initiative is so vital, it's historic. It's transformational. Unity of effort is going to enable department decision making to be much more transparent and much more cohesive, better integrated across planning, programming, budgeting, and budget ex execution in the Department of Homeland Security. That's an absolutely vital enterprise and the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review is going to provide the analytic and strategic foundations that's going to help turn the vision of the Unity of Effort initiative into reality. And in a moment, I'm going to introduce my colleagues, and they'll take on particularly important issues that the QHSR illuminates. Before I do that, I want to leave you with uh, one thought, and that is, 
Although Secretary Johnson's Unity of Effort initiative is absolutely vital and just what the Department needs at this moment, it's also insufficient. Let me talk about the distinction between unity of effort and what we really need in the Department, which is unity of command. Unity of effort is great when no one's in charge. Let me give you a prime example from the Homeland Security Enterprise, and that is disaster response. Governors don't work for the president. Governors are sovereign. They're the independently elected chief executives of their states. And so when there's a catastrophe, like Superstorm Sandy, the challenge is how do you bring cohesion together between state capabilities and federal capabilities? For example, state national guard forces under the command of governors and federal military forces under the command of the president. You do it through unity of effort. And I have to say, unity of effort is precisely what the Department of Homeland Security needs today when cohesion is so lacking and when such great opportunities for progress are now underway thanks to the leadership of Secretary Johnson. Necessary but not sufficient because ultimately one person really is in charge of the Department of Homeland Security. That is the Secretary of the Department. And I look forward to the day when unity of effort has been successfully accomplished, when thanks to QHSR, we've made progress in the next few years towards unity of effort. I look forward to the day, and I look forward to engaging all of you and helping to make this happen. Someday there'll be unity of command in the Department of Homeland Security, and the Secretary of the Department will exercise the kind of authority that routinely the Secretary of Defense the Secretary of State and the heads of other federal departments routinely exercise. Now let me turn to the uh, introduction of the panel. First, uh, David Berteau. David, it's wonderful to see you again. David is the Senior Vice President and Director of the CSIS National Security Program on Industry and Resources. He's also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University and at the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs and served in the Department of Defense under four secretaries. Jeez, you'd think he'd wise up at some point. So. <laughs> uh, anyway, David, it's, a, it's an honor to sit on the panel together with you. Thanks. Thank you, Paul, uh, for that very kind introduction. Uh, you get to serve under a lot of secretaries if you choose those who turn over rapidly uh, in, in the cycles, if you will. Um, I want to look at three things in my comments this morning. One is how this QHSR is a step, or whether it's a step in the right direction in maturing and strengthening uh, the department's risk assessment and planning uh, capabilities, if you will, and in looking at the resources that are aligned with that. Um, I want to compare it a little bit to other quadrennial reviews because we seem to have a lot of them these days, um, and they're, they're very convenient uh, as a method of comparison. And I want to talk a little bit about the unity of effort comment that you made at the end there. Um, since its inception, though, the department has had challenges that included a lot of what I would refer to as boundary struggles. Now, this is not border issues, but this is bureaucratic boundaries, if you will. It's useful to remember that somewhere between a fourth and a third of the Department of Homeland Security spending is not on Homeland Security. It's on government functions that existed long before DHS was created and that just came with those entities when they moved into DHS. So there's an automatic tension, if you will, on that boundary inside DHS itself. In addition, roughly a third, sometimes more than a third, of total U.S. government spending on Homeland Security is not inside the Department of Homeland Security. A big chunk of it is in DOD, some of it's in the State Department, a big chunk of it's in Health and Human Services, and other agencies across the federal government. Um, and then finally, of course, as has been mentioned both by Secretary Cohn and by Secretary Stockton, is large parts of Homeland Security uh, don't belong to the federal government at all. They're part of state, and local, tribal, et cetera. Um, and they never let you forget that because that's the first responder part of it, if you will. Um, forgetting that the real first responders generally are actually members of the general public who happen to be first on the scene. Um, so it, it, each of those requires attention to boundary issues, if you will. 
and, uh, and, and to questions of is a particular program or is it support for resources or funding or p personnel for a particular program in or out of DHS, as well as where inside DHS it fits. So even Unity of Command inside Department of Homeland Security is still going to leave you with a host of boundary condition issues uh, with which you have to deal. And the QHSR, I think, has to fit inside that. One of the things we do at CSIS in my program is we look at DHS spending, and in particular we look at DHS spending on contracts and grants. I would refer you to a report we released on that just a couple of weeks ago. And somewhere around 40 to 45 percent of all of the Department of Homeland Security spending is on contracts or grants. So it penetrates into those boundary conditions, if you will. So I think this QHSR does a reasonably good job of thinking inside those contexts, if you will. It's also useful, I think, to reflect back on history. Many of you were around when the department was first stood up and when the administration proposed creating a department. Uh, actually, Congress, of course, proposed it first, but the administration had a better idea, so it put its own proposals on the table. And it was compared to the Defense Department, quote, the largest reorganization in the U.S. government since the creation of DOD. Well, keep in mind, it took 11 years between the original National Security uh, Act of 1947 and the Defense Department evolving to the structure that it basically has today with combatant commands in charge of forces and, and the military services in charge of training and equipping and providing those forces. It actually took nearly 40 years before the structure that's in place today resulting from the Goldwater Nichols Defense Reorganization Act of 1986 was passed and took root. So it's useful that when you're reviewing DHS to keep that kind of a time frame in mind, if you will, in terms of, of assessments. Um, in, in comparing the QHSR, both this one and the previous one, to other quadrennial reviews, and there's been five inside DOD, six if you count the one that wasn't called the QDR, the bottom-up review in 1993, and we've had one in the State Department, they've kicked off another, and other agencies are picking up the idea that it's useful to do this. One of the basic tensions that's in place here is how much attention do you pay to funding constraints? And, you know, in fact, uh, uh, you will have the Defense Department will say that their QDR was informed by budgetary constraints but not constrained by budgetary numbers. Now, this becomes difficult for some. In fact, one of my favorite quotes is a Wall Street analyst who says, I can't read this report referring to the, the uh, uh, 2014 QHSR, it doesn't have any numbers in it. Now, you know, I'm an English major, so I'm used to reading things without numbers, but, uh, but in fact, there's a, there's a grain of truth to that. If it doesn't connect to the budget, then you have to, to ask how, what's the impact, if you will. But the important question is not whether the review or the report is constrained by the budget, but in fact, what's the important, que the important question is how do the budgets and programs and resources take the trade-offs that are either explicit or implicit inside the QHSR and reflect those trade-offs in the budget. And we, for that, I think we'll have to wait until the FY16 budget is submitted um, next February or March. The good news is that this QHSR, whether by design or, or, or result of inertia, um, uh, doesn't matter, is perfectly timed to affect that 2016 budget. The OMB guidance has already been issued. DHS is assembling that budget. They'll be submitting it for OMB, for the Office of Management and Budget Review uh, in the next few months, and ultimately the President will submit it. That budget, by the way, I would point out, is the only one that Secretary Johnson, in his tenure of, as Secretary of Homeland Security, assuming that it only goes to the end of this administration, uh, January 20th, uh, 2017, it's the only budget that he will build defend before the Office of Management Budget and the Congress, and then actually get to execute. It's the only one. If he's there for the full two, three years of his term, that's the only budget he'll get to do in end to end, if you will. So the timing is perfect, and the capability that the QHSR provides is useful input to that. So the value will be how this helps shape the trade-offs and arrange the priorities in those budgets, right? And, and maybe, potentially, even in the FY15 appropriations, the House is marked up there, Homeland Security Appropriations Bill, the Senate is marking up theirs this week. They'll reach some kind of agreement. Eventually, we'll have an appropriation, if you will. So it's possible that some of the priority trade-offs, uh, implicit or explicit in the QHSR, will be reflected in the 15 budget. But the place where the department really has to bring it to bear is in the 16 budget. I would note, though, that it's not good enough guidance. You can read this QHSR, and it doesn't tell you all you need to know to make those trade-offs. There will be additional guidance required inside DHS in order to reflect that in the budgets. 
I would also note that one of the, the things that I look for in this QHSR and did not find much of is testing those priorities and trade-offs and, and all of the, the risks that were highlighted in, uh, in Secretary Cohn's remarks against the real world through exercises and through, through what, uh, what we call in the military war games, although they're not they're much more than a game, obviously. Um, there was not much attention to that. I would hope and assume that that's going to be reflected in, uh, in what the uh, implementation shows there. But I think here is where that unity of effort approach becomes critical, and it, because it provides a structure in which that kind of guidance, if issued, and those kinds of exercise testings, if applied, can be uh, done appropriately and in a timely way to be reflected in the 2016 budget. The last thing is what surprised me the most about this QHSR. I have a, a disclosure here. I was a consultant on the first QHSR. I worked on the, the study group in Homeland Security Planning and Capabilities Development. And, uh, and that study group looked at how each part of DHS did its own planning and how it used the results of that planning to translate into both resources and the expenditure of those resources to develop capabilities. Um, and we did, a, we did a, a very nice report. I brought it as a, a prop here. It, it sort of meets the bulk requirement. This is printed both sides, about 200 pages here, as input to the QHSR. Uh, I believe that the final 2010 QHSR itself had maybe one paragraph uh, that it took from this effort, if you will. So if you judge effort to result, you could be discouraged at that part of the process. It was still worthwhile because what it did for probably the first time was it got all the different parts of DHS to talk to one another about how they do planning, how they turn planning into capabilities, if you will. Um, so I thought it was worthwhile even then. But then I picked up the new QHSR last week when it was issued. And in fact, what I saw was this did not just sit idle for four years. DHS was actually using the input from the previous QHSR, not just in planning and capabilities development, but in management issues and a host of other areas, and actually flowed those into the 2014 QHSR. Um, I frankly was, first of all, uh, I tend to be a cynic when it comes to government taking advantage of prior work, um, and I was astonished not only to see it, but to see it done very, very well, and I'm not sure that I've seen that in any other quadrennial review in any other department. So the bottom line is that this QHSR is a step in the right direction. Um, its real value, though, will be tested by how it translates into budgets and plans and implementation. Uh, and I think the unity of effort approach uh, offers some, some positive opportunity in that regard, uh, but we'll really see the results in, uh, in nine months when the FY16 budget goes to the Congress. I would also submit that DHS being able to use the risk approach that it was outlined in the QHSR as part of its defense of that budget should help a lot in terms of defending the budget, both on the Hill, perhaps even more importantly, inside the Office of Management and Budget. Um, and so I'm really, I could say, I can't wait until the FY16 budget comes out. I know all of you share that with me here this morning, so thank you. <laughs> thank you, David. Thanks, David. And now I have the honor of introducing Matt Fleming. Uh, Matt is a fellow with the Homeland Security Studies Analysis Institute, and let me say, one of the nation's leading scholars, experts on cybersecurity. It's great to have you here on the panel. Uh, he worked on cyber issues in the United States Department of Defense, uh, directed a number of cybersecurity programs in the past. He's an adjunct professor at Georgetown University and has just a terrific background. So, Matt, please. Take it away. Well, thanks, Paul. That's uh, extremely kind of you uh, to say. And uh, good after, uh, good morning, I suppose, or still good, good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank CSIS for, uh, for the kind invitation to be here today uh, and say that it's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces on the panel here uh, and in the audience. Um, before I begin, I should say that my views here today are mine alone, do not represent DHS or my employers. Um, but I'm here to talk a little bit about cyber uh, and cyber in the QHSR. And so I should say that uh, for those who don't follow cyber, these continue to be exciting times in the field of cyber. Uh, we've had some really interesting policy developments in the last year plus uh, with the Executive Order 13636. Uh, Presidential Policy Directive 21, both of which are relating uh, to critical infrastructure and cybersecurity. Um, we've seen this cybersecurity framework uh, developed by NIST. 
We've seen an update of the uh, National Infrastructure Protection Plan, and all of these things somehow mention or touch on cyber directly or indirectly. Uh, certainly, there have been many high-profile uh, events. Many of us may have been victims of such events, perhaps Target, uh, the Target breach, any other breach. There seem to be uh, breaches every day. Uh, the heart bleed issue, which may mean something to some people, but it was certainly seen as one of the most significant events in recent history. Uh, Snowden, of course, still hangs around uh, the implications of Edward Snowden and his release of information. Um, and I think we live in a world, and Alan touched on many of these things, we live in a world in which uh, the Internet of Things is here-ish, is certainly coming, in which uh, we will have sensors and actuators deployed everywhere, and our fridge will talk to our toaster, and uh, our jet engines, they already talk to the front of the plane, but they'll talk to the mothership and tell, uh, tell the guys on the ground that the starboard engine number two is a little hot and maybe you need a new part in flight. Um, and so what that means is this rapid expansion of the attack surface. And then, of course, we've seen this indictment of five Chinese uh, PLA operators, uh, whether this goes anywhere is, is, you know, we'll see, but it's a very exciting time in cyber, and I suppose that's both a good thing and a bad thing. So, so I'm here to talk a little bit about what I see as, as uh, you know, what does a QHS, uh, QHSR say about cyber? Where do I think we've seen the, the biggest changes since the last QHSR? Uh, and I do have a couple uh, mild criticisms, which I may leave until questions. I'd like to start, though, by saying uh, that I, you know, I'd like to congratulate DHS on what I think is a really thoughtful document. Um, and it's the kind of document that at least I know I will be using and digesting and reading and rereading over the course of the next several years as I do my own research uh, for DHS and on Homeland Security issues. Uh, some of you may know Chris Bellavita from the Naval Postgrad School, and he's, he's posted some comments on this version, essentially saying, uh, throwing praise to DHS, and I'd like to align myself with his views. Um, but in terms of cyber, so Alan uh, put up the four main goals of this QHSR on cyber, and they're about things like strengthening the security and resilience of critical infrastructure, uh, securing the .gov domain, uh, advancing law enforcement and incident response and reporting capabilities, and strengthening the ecosystem. Now, none of this is necessarily new. These are issues that the department has been working on for several years, but it certainly is a uh, perhaps more detailed um, uh, overview of what the department is doing. And so, you know, in, in this, uh, just in thinking about strengthening uh, critical infrastructure, I mean, we're talking about increasing information sharing, a very popular uh, phrase, but extremely important idea in, in cyber. Uh, increasing situational awareness, and there's discussion, some of you may have seen about the idea of a weather map, sort of a real-time weather map for cybersecurity that DHS talks about. Uh, we, we hear about the ensuring the provision of essential services, right, and this is, uh, for those who work in the critical infrastructure world, this is really the point. We don't, we don't label something critical infrastructure because that makes us feel good. The importance is that we have a need in our society for electricity, for telecommunications, for various other things. And what we care about and the reason that we protect critical infrastructure is so that we continue the provision of these essential services. So I think the QHSR brings out this, this importance uh, uh, in cyber of continuing the provision of essential services. And there's discussion of interdependencies and cascading effects, very important in cyber. Uh, you know, we live in a world in which we have very obvious interdependencies, but also quite non-obvious interdependencies. And so much attention uh, needs to be paid to understanding these things better uh, and, and their cascading effects. And I think this was also highlighted in the National Infrastructure Protection Plan, the new version uh, and, and so I think this is a real positive. Uh, there's some discussion securing the .gov about, you know, coordinating purchasing across the federal government. It seems like a good idea, perhaps to our budgeting, uh, earlier uh, mention of budgeting, this will save us some money. Uh, deploying cyber tools, if you follow 
cyber at all in DHS, you will have heard things like, uh, words like Einstein or phrases like continuous diagnostics and mitigation. These are fairly important programs, if not extremely important programs to the department, and so of course they're called out in this, in this QHSR. We see a little bit more in this version about advancing law enforcement and incident response on reporting capabilities, uh, deterring and disrupting cybercrime, and then, of course, this idea of strengthening the cyber ecosystem, uh, you know, how, how DHS can perhaps uh, work to drive innovation and cost-effective solutions throughout uh, the cyber ecosystem, um, conducting research and development, uh, uh, and uh, transitioning the findings of R&D efforts into practice, obviously quite important. I would say that in this, uh, in this version of the QHSR, we see perhaps a clear articulation of the cyber mission. A lot of this stuff was in the last version, but it just seems to be a bit more direct uh, in this version. I think that's a great thing. Um, and then uh, we see, of course, as Alan mentioned, this discussion of public-private partnerships, very important in information sharing and other aspects of cyber. Um, to draw out a little bit more of the differences between this and the last QHSR, I think uh, one of the most welcome developments uh, is this greater emphasis, more explicit emphasis on critical infrastructure. Um, and perhaps this is not surprising given the policy environment with these executive orders and presidential directives. Um, but certainly I, I, for one, and I work in this field, so perhaps I would say this, but I, for one, applaud this focus on, on critical infrastructure and understanding interdependencies and this idea of cyber-physical convergence right, that's, that physical harm can be caused through the cyber vector, and of course, cyber harm can be caused through the physical vector, all very important. Um, there's a greater discussion of roles and responsibilities, particularly with DHS, DOJ, and, and the Department of Defense. Um, I alluded to this greater emphasis on law enforcement, um, and, and I would think there's, I find it, as I read it, a, a, a clearer and deeper articulation of the threat uh, and vulnerabilities. And in the interest of time, I have a couple criticisms, but I'll leave those to questions. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. And next we have uh, Dr. Mark Frey. Mark is a senior associate with the CSIS Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Program. He's also senior director in the Washington office of Steptoe and Johnson, LLP. Previously, Dr. Frey held senior positions at DHS, including chief of staff for the Office of Policy Development, and most notably, uh, director of the Visa Waiver Program. That's, that was really something. Great, great achievements, Mark, and uh, welcome this morning. Uh, thanks, Paul, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here, uh, particularly on this distinguished panel. I'll note, uh, before I start, I, I may be the only person on the panel who's actually an alumnus of DHS and not of DOD. So at, at, at some point, you may find me rising to defend the honor of my former uh, organization uh, as we go. Um, I was also involved, um, at least to a, a relatively small degree, in the formation of the first QHSR. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that and a little bit about how this new one differs much the way that, that, that Matt did. My focus is going to be on uh, the border flows issue that uh, Alan highlighted. And, and in some ways, th that's the easy one in that and, and this is where I go back a little bit to the first Q, QHSR process, that's one of the areas, perhaps uh, in opposition to cyber and then uh, to, to counterterrorism that Ozzy will be talking about, where that's a pretty core DHS mission that doesn't have a lot of other players in the space that they have to fight some of these boundary battles with um, that Dave mentioned. Border security, managing the flow of people and goods in, in, into and out of the country, you know, that's DHS, and it was components of DHS before DHS was, was established. And so a lot of the time we spent in the first QHSR was fighting with some of, fighting is probably not the right word, discussions with some of our interagency partners on proper roles and responsibilities for things like counterterrorism and in particular cybersecurity, and some of those debates are still ongoing. So uh, borders a, a little bit easier there. And it's also worth saying, um, before getting into what this document says, that that's also an area where DHS has had a tremendous amount of success. There, there is now a unified face at the border. Um, there are now programs, particularly these trusted traveler programs, uh, that do what uh, Alan noted the QHSR is supposed to do, which is risk, risk segmentation, so-called shrinking the haystack. Uh, it's very difficult to find one bad guy 
or one bad cargo container in the flow of millions upon millions of, of people or goods. And so risk evaluating these based on the provision of advanced information, information sharing, international cooperation, that's all to the good. Trusted travel programs like Global Entry and relatedly uh, PreCheck and on the cargo side, CTPAT, also all, all very much to the good. And so operationally, DHS has had a lot of success um, in, in, in doing this work. So to transition to the current QHSR and whether it can continue this success um, or, or build upon this success, I think the good news in, uh, is first that a lot of that role setting debate is largely over and DHS now has these five core missions and a key role to play in them and in particular it's got the lead role in this border security issue. But I also think that it's become a more complicated is not the right word, but it's one of the things that the QHSR does not touch on enough, but that I think DHS really needs to do more of in, in practice, is this international engagement that Alan talked about. It, it's there, it's, it's providing some, some lip service to it in a sense, but actually how that happens and how DHS leverages its large international footprint and some of its programs, whether it's, it's offering global entry membership to partner countries, whether it's establishing pre-clearance facilities in, in, in countries. Um, there hasn't been, to my view, as much rhyme or reason as to how those things are established. If you look, for example, at the list of global entry member countries, I defy anyone to find a pattern as to why these countries were chosen. Why is Panama a member? Well, I'm not sure. You know, does Germany make sense? The UK make sense? Yeah, I, I can see that. But some of these other things don't make sense, and why some countries aren't included also doesn't make sense. So I think to the extent the QHSR can help drive a more coherent and holistic look at how DHS approaches international partnerships, I think that would be a good thing. And that's probably one of my main criticisms about how the border section and the flow section um, is addressed. Um, I also want to follow up a bit um, on the point that David made in, in that the, the proof really will be in the pudding, right? The, the document sets out um, a very interesting and, and useful analytical framework, particularly with respect to borders, dividing the different flows into these three categories, the, the market-driven, the non-market-driven, the ideological, um, or, and, the, and the lawful, is a very useful way of thinking about it and will help drive responses. Uh, on one hand, you know, the proof will be in how these budgetary decisions are made, and it's, it's, it won't surprise anyone that if you look at the record of the previous QHSR, budget decisions and spending decisions did not track very closely with that document. Um, now, maybe we've learned from that, and, and hopefully with that under our belt, we'll have better success this time. Um, but it's, that's where this matters. If not, it's, a, it's just a document. It's a, actually a fairly compelling document. It's a well-written document, particularly for a government document that was the process of uh, God knows how many interagency processes and revisions. Um, and so it's, it, it will always be useful, but it will only really be effective if it drives these budgetary decisions um, that, that, that David mentioned. It will also only be useful if it drives operational decision making. And, and to that point, um, I wanted to touch a little bit on a, a, a follow-on memo that I think was up there uh, when Alan was, was com concluding his presentation, but it's about a uh, DHS-wide campaign plan for the U.S. Southern border. So this was a, actually a follow-on memo uh, issued in, I think, May, so just a couple months ago, following the Secretary's Unity of Effort memo, which has gotten quite a bit of attention uh, uh, during the talk and, and during this panel, which I agree is a, is a good start um, because DHS certainly needs um, more cohesion, although I'm not sure, maybe I'm just too pessimistic, that they'll ever get to a unity of command um, or maybe even need to get to a unity of command, but that's, that's a separate discussion. But I think the key part about this memo on the DHS-wide um, intercomponent campaign plan for the southern border is that it explicitly ties this plan to the QHSR and the, the analytics and the themes addressed in the QHSR. And in fact, it, it assigns Allen uh, as the assistant secretary for, as co-lead for the development of, of the border plan and how to set outcomes and targets for the, blow, for the border flows as they map back to the QHSR. And I also note, and I'm, I'm sorry Alan left because it would have been great to ask him, that that, that, that review is supposed to be approved by June 30th. Um, so it would be great to know <laughs> if that's actually taking the place. But, but, but the, the broader point is that 
we will not only see budgetarily, but hopefully we'll begin to see operationally if the way the QHSR starts talking about um, or is talking about thinking about these issues is actually put into practice by the various component agencies in, in DHS. And I'll make two quick um, other points, and then I will, I will turn it over uh, to Ozzy to, to conclude. Um, and this harkens back actually to a previous CSIS discussion on, on border metrics and technology. I also think a, a potential value of, of the framework established by the QHSR in the border sense is that if it's done right, it can actually help provide us with the metrics that we actually need in this larger border debate. One of the things that's bedeviling the entire community for, forever is how do we measure control of the border? What does operational control of the border mean? What does border security mean? And that has implications both operationally, it has implications legislatively for this immigration debate that, that we're involved in and, and all sorts of other reasons. And so if you think about things the way the QHSR directs us to, I think that can lead us to coming up with better metrics with respect to these different border flows. And that would be a very, very good thing uh, for the wider DHS enterprise. Um, and then the final comment I'll make, and maybe this will be a, something we can talk about during the discussion, is that Obviously, the QHSR is, is looking strategically. It's not down in the weeds on, on these issues. Um, and it's, it's not easily applied to, to issues that pop up that you don't expect or that you haven't prepared for. Uh, but I'd be, interesting, I'd be interested, in, and I would, would have asked Alan this as well as he stated, how you would apply the QHSR principles, for example, to the current unaccompanied minor issue that we're experiencing on the southern border, and how the way the QS, QHSR analytical framework would inform what is now a crisis uh, on the border and, and how, what policy and operational decisions and budgetary decisions should be put forward uh, to solve that. And with that, I'll um, happily take questions when we're done. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Ozzie Nelson, the excellence of the CSIS program in Homeland Security. Ozzie, uh, you're responsible for much of that. Uh, congratulations, and uh, Ozzie is now Vice President for Business Development at Cross Match Technologies, which you've accomplished so much in your distinguished career. Oz, Ozzie, welcome today. Uh, thanks, Paul. I appreciate it. It's good to be back. So batting cleanup, you usually have bases loaded or nobody's on, right? So uh, I think that my colleagues here have cleaned the bases already. So I'll try to keep this short, and I appreciate the, um, the, uh, the opportunity to be here. Um, the, the document, yeah, I think Secretary Cohen captured it accurately, is a demonstration of the maturation of the department. And after only 10 years, it is quite remarkable. Um, it, it is, it's a pretty impressive document. When I sat down to read it, I was, thought it would be underwhelmed. It was the opposite. Um, however, there's still a lot to be done. And often, you know, these documents are the target pinatas for the media and for pundits to talk about how fluffy they are, what they don't accomplish, but they really are table stakes to have a coordinated uh, unity of effort. It's the point from which all other actions can take place. Um, I'm here to focus on the counterterrorism section, and I was thrilled um, uh, to see that counterterrorism is going to remain the cornerstone of Homeland Security. Uh, very important, I think, with the killing of bin Laden, that um, there has been a desire by many to put this nuisance of terrorism behind us and press forward onto the larger issues of national security. Um, but terrorism, unfortunately, is here for us to stay. In 2011, the U.S. spent more on its military than the next 13 nations combined. Building and maintaining conventional military force is just no longer viable for nations or entities that want to have power in this space. They're going to do it asymmetrically. It's a greater return on your investment. And asymmetrically means terrorism and militancy. It means cyber. Uh, and it means WMD, which happened to be three of DHS's core missions that I've identified. So put on top of that DHS's mandate of going across 22 departments and agencies, from the federal to the state and local, and then having to product and protect an infrastructure of which they don't really own. And then do it under the auspices of you're the departments and you're the agencies that interact with the American public more closely than any other department or agency in the U.S. government. It's an incredibly difficult mission. What has made this even more difficult in the realm of terrorism is that we've kind of been a victim of our success. You know, in many ways, the, the dismantling of Al-Qaeda core, which we all agree has pretty much occurred, has pushed this threat back down to the regional and even the local levels, which is where we want it. 
the, the brilliance of bin, of bin Laden was that he was able to bring all those entities together into a, a formulated strategy. Now we've pushed it back down. The negative of that is it makes it much more difficult. The analogy I use, it's like dropping a, you know, breaking a glass on the floor. You can pick up the big pieces, you see where the general breaks are, but where are the other pieces that you missed and how do you track those and they're really difficult to see until you step on them. And that's what DHS now has from a counterterrorism perspective. Um, the threat remains, again, not just we see that with uh, regional groups in, in Africa, but we see this issue of, of lone offenders, as DHS calls them, inside the United States. And the question was brought up early is what motivates these individuals? It, it, it doesn't matter. It can be today, it can be a radical interpretation of a religion, and tomorrow it could be a domestic group, or it could be so, uh, something else. We just don't know, and you can't single those types of things out, not when you have DHS. You have to be able to protect and prepare for however the threat may un unfold. And that's one of the things that I think is good about this document, is they talk about how these terrorists are going to potentially attack the United States, or how can they threaten us. They talk about the issue of active shooters, about IEDs. They talk about the importance of the transportation sector. And they also put, bring up back to the forefront of the issue of an IND, an improvised nuclear device. If we think that 9-11 changed our view of the world, you can only imagine what a nuclear device in Washington, D.C. or New York City, how it would change our view of the world. And so they have a very difficult mission. I'll talk a little bit about the risk security. Uh, I think the risk security, risk-based security approach is a brilliant. It, we all have done it in our lives. We, DOD has done it. DHX actually is trying to codify it. And as document said, they really are leading the US government in this field. We cannot protect all people from all things all the time. We have to figure out how to do that. And DHS has implemented a bunch of programs recently to get that done. One thing with risk-based security that we all have to understand as the American people is that one, risk-based security means we're going to assume risk. We're not going to get it all. And it means we're going to have priorities, which means there's going to be, in the budget cycle, haves and have-nots. The highest priorities are going to get the money. The lower ones aren't. Just a couple, um, and so I was very happy to see the document take that on. One, as a former pilot, I like lists. We were, we were a life of checklists. So I'm just going to wrap up and find out how five things I liked about the QHR and five things that I, I didn't like about it. Uh, I love the thoughtfulness and the complexity of the document. I like the fact that they took on the hard issues. They mentioned community policing. They mentioned, um, you know, things like diffusion centers. Those are hard issues, and they didn't shy away from them. I like the fact that they tried to put some definition behind their taxonomy, which has been, some would say, intellectually lazy in the past. We're going to have partnerships, and we're going to have information sharing. Now they're starting to define what a partnership means and what are both sides going to get out of that. I think it's forward thinking. I talk about the black swans, swans in there, and they mention things that they don't know. They realize they don't have it right, and that this is only a, 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 a snapshot in time. I love the document in the back that talks about basic roles and responsibilities. I think we should start every interagency meeting in DC with that on the table. And then last, I think it talks about actually consolidation, consolidating things like diffusion centers um, and screening centers. They're saying we need to make internal changes. Things I didn't like about it, the document is too complex in many ways. They covered everything. It was so thorough. Um, and there's still some lingering DHS language in there. From a counterterrorism perspective, I do not like the term lone offenders. They are terrorists. They're not offenders. Offenders are people that don't pay their parking tickets. Um, I don't answer the questions about how, and my panels have talked about that. And lastly, the biggest issue of keeping the department to be the department that we want it to be is congressional oversight. And they didn't mention that in the document. Thank you for the opportunity to be on the panel. Thank you, Ozzy. Uh, I promise it will end promptly at 11. All of you are busy, uh, important people. Uh, but that does leave us with some time for questions. I had one in my back pocket, but I'm going to defer to all of you. If we could uh, start uh, right up in front. Good morning, Adam Teal. I'm a Deputy Secretary of Public Safety and Homeland Security for the Commonwealth of Virginia, and I appreciate and perhaps exemplify the mentions of state and local governments as part of the Homeland Security enterprise. I'm interested in some concrete examples, perhaps, from you all or some concrete suggestions for how we can strengthen unity of effort for those of us occupying the middle and the bottom uh, of uh, the space, depending on how one's uh, perspective is calibrated. Thanks for your leadership in Virginia, too. Uh, who'd like to answer that? 
I'm going to turn to the mission framework in depth, which is this chart towards the back of the QHSR that essentially takes the, the, the missions and breaks them down into sub-goals, if you will. This is the place where I was particularly saying we need additional guidance on how this is going to translate into actual resource decisions. I was focusing in terms of the internal federal budget, but I think the same thing is true. What, what I would do if I were you is look for the places where that goal aligns with where Virginia, for instance, in your case, needs to have better federal interface and better federal visibility and effort or focus or resources and, and go from the bottom up inside that mission framework. And that's how I would take this document and turn it into what you would do. Oh, very quickly. Yeah, really quickly. And I, so I think that uh, I have four criticisms of the document. I may or may not get to them. But one of them is this issue of there, there's a discussion of roles and responsibilities. But cyber, as Mark noted, is a team sport, uh, perhaps uh, less so than border uh, security. And, and I think that that thread could have been pulled a little bit more to expand on what is it that actually we want state and local, even private citizens, to do. Um, I really would have liked to see more of that. Thanks, Matt. Who else has a question? Jess, can you introduce yourself, please? <laughs> Good morning. My name is Jesse Iannotti. I'm currently working international issues with the Department of Homeland Security. Previously worked in the Pentagon for Dr. Stockton um, in the office of HD and ASA. Um, I actually share the perspective of, of one of the panelists on there are some tremendous successes that DHS has had in the years since its creation, yet I think we all acknowledge that there are still significant challenges, particularly in the unity of effort. As I was uh, hearing the commentary, I just jotted down a few of the challenges that I've noted, being a little bit uh, behind the scenes now, you know, everything from the logistical to you know, multiple different sites, dispersed real estate across the area, personnel challenges, we don't have a cadre of Homeland Security professionals yet. You know, we don't have a Goldwater Nichols that's encouraged really the jointness and the structures that DOD has had the advantage of, or really a culture of sort of that purple, born purple sort of approach, um, as well as some capstone guidance documents that DOD has had, you know, things like the GAF and the JSCAP that really direct components in a way that DHS hasn't quite gotten to. So that was a long lead up to my direct question to this distinguished panel, which is, of those and perhaps others that you would know, what do you see as the biggest challenge? And were you in the Department of Homeland Security right now, what would be your focus for improving? Thanks. Who would like to take that one on? This is, I guess, where being the DHS guy comes back and, <laughs> and uh, bites me. Oh, the other guys, no, we don't, we don't have that. Um, oh, well, I, I think it, I think it is easy to to talk about the the, the problems. I think it's worth as. Um, uh, maybe it was David or maybe it was Paul who said that we, we do have to keep some perspective on the problems, particularly in the, the timeline, right? We, we are a little over 10 years into this reorganization, and, and in the beginning it was pretty fitful, and, you know, it took several years for folks to stop saying, I'm legacy customs, I'm legacy INS, you know, and actually say, no, I'm CVP now, um, and, and things like that. And, and then even when those issues are solved, you then have other interagency issues with, you know, what is the proper cyber role? for DHS, for example, vis-a-vis -vis the NSA, or what is the proper CT role for DHS vis-a-vis -vis the FBI and, and others, and in fact, to what is the proper role of DHS's international programs vis-a-vis -vis the Department of State. So, so those things are all there, as is the fact that, you know, you, you can go, you can spend your entire day going from a meeting between TSA and the NAC and, and, and everywhere else. Um, so, you know, all that being said, I actually think that, that the, the biggest problem that DHS is facing is not this cohesion, because I think it's getting there, particularly if you put it in historical context. Um, I, I think the problem is that there just hasn't yet been enough of the internal institution building. Things at DHS, a lot of things that are successful are successful in part because senior leadership, including the secretary, but also the assistant secretaries and down, are focused on them. And if they're not focused on them, they tend to just sort of happen or not happen. And not, there, there's not a strong institutional framework that perhaps some of these more mature uh, departments have to make things run on autopilot, in a sense, when senior leadership is actually not asking for daily updates on those issues. Thanks. Dave? No? OK. Uh, we have time for one more question. Who's, who's got one? Yes, ma'am. 
Yes, thank you again for your time. I'm with the Center for the Study of the Presidency in Congress. My name is Summer Fields. Um, Mr. Fleming, I had a question for you. You used the phrase, um, we have sort of less specific interdependencies, and I was wondering what you were thinking when you were saying that, if you could go more into that um, when it comes to cyber. So I, I might have said we have obvious and non-obvious interdependencies. So I think there are, um, you know, we know that, I mean, you know, we all have iPhones, it's like an Apple convention here, but I need power. I know I need power. But there may be other things, and I need comms, right, or this is just a brick. But there may be times when I don't realize that actually there's something going on in the background, a connection that I haven't thought about. Or uh, as we see services roll out, for example, that ride the internet, that have an internet protocol, uh, you know, the internet of things, I'm focusing on the internet of things right now, um, lots of services, you know, you can have your home locks and your, your um, Nest thermostat. Well, do we realize that actually, so that means we need comms, perhaps, to turn on our thermostat. We need power in ways that we perhaps hadn't thought about. And that others who are doing the planning hadn't thought about. So as we move to, buy, to medical devices that have, that are sort of also part of this internet of things, are we thinking that wow, somebody's glucose monitor or some uh, pacemaker might actually require not just a battery on its own, but connectivity in certain ways. And we need to think about those non-obvious. And of course, they're much more important in critical infrastructure. Hope that helps. Well, uh, thanks to the distinguished members of the panel. Thanks for CSIS. And thanks for all of you, your citizens, your partners in Homeland Security.